Hello, everyone. I'm David Tunick, and I'll be moderating today. Uh, there are about uh, three to 400 of you out there stretching across nine time zones from Sweden, Belgium, Austria, France, and Ireland to the west coast of the United States. If you're in California, as many of you are, I hope you think of it as going on watch with the opportunity of a beautiful sunrise. It's my job to uh, introduce myself and um, I'm a member of all three sponsoring clubs today and I'm involved in safety at sea for all three. I myself sail a 54 year old SNS A&R 55 foot aluminum yawl that is now in the Netherlands. Um, if we Americans are ever allowed back into Europe, uh, my plan is to single hand the boat back to the Northeast to the United States this coming summer. I've had it in Europe now for the last 20 years. Now we're gonna hear brief remarks from the Commodore of the three sponsoring clubs and uh, first, uh, my friend Commodore Bob Medlin of the Cruising Club of America, speaking to us from Toronto today. Good morning, David. Thank you. Good morning, all. As David said, we're here in Toronto. Just welcome to uh, all the members and guests of the Cruising Club of America, the Storm Trisel Club, and the North American Station. We're extremely happy to be sponsoring the uh, this morning's presentation as a cross burgee event with our three clubs. It's wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues participating. Thanks to David Tunick and Rich DeMillon for uh, arranging this splendid uh, seminar this morning. Don't give up the ship with our esteemed panelists sharing their lessons and experiences for our benefit. We're looking forward to hearing how planning, preparation, practice, teamwork, leadership, contribute to a culture of safety and reduce the risk of having to give up the ship. Thank you, David. Thank you, uh, Commodore Medlin. And now Commodore Ed Cesar of the Storm Trisel Club. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Bob. And good morning, everybody. Uh, I think I'll, I'd just like to echo Commodore Medlin's remarks um, and say how great it is to see the three clubs working together um, and thank Rich and David, not only for this morning's presentation, but for all the work that they've been doing, turning this winter of discontent into one of education and entertainment uh, in a variety of forms. Uh, and I think uh, it is a perhaps unexpected um, uh, benefit of the pandemic that we can come together in this format and learn important lessons together. Thank you again, David and Rich. Thanks very much. Uh... Commodore Cesar, and from the North American Station of the Royal Scandinavian Yacht Clubs in New Lanska Yacht uh, where the Commodore is called uh, Post Captain, we have Post Captain Nick Oram. Nick, you're up. Thank you, David. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome all the members of the North American Station and uh, the Storm Trisol and CCA. Um, I note that at least one of our West Coast members uh, is, has set an early alarm and is joining us this morning. And uh, those of our members in Scandinavia will probably see the sun go down before, uh, before this presentation is over. I'd like to thank uh, Rich DeMullen and our panelists for putting together what promises to be an exciting presentation. David tells me that uh, we have some, I think David said 480 screens registered for this event. So that speaks to the extraordinary interest in this topic. Uh, finally, none of this would be possible without the indi indefatigable efforts of David Tunick, who contributes so much to each of our organizations. And so thank you, David, and back to you. Thanks very much, uh, Nick. Thank you, Commodores, and thank all of you out there for attending uh, today's seminar. Uh, besides the large contingents from the three sponsoring clubs, we also have, a spe have special guests, uh, including members of the Distinguished Irish Cruising Club, arranged by North American Station member John Clemenson, 
uh, members of the Blue Water Sailing Club out of Eastern Massachusetts, invited by panelist Len Thibodeau, and the Newport Offshore Sailing Association. Uh, that's the West Coast Club that hosts the annual Newport Ensenada race. And um, uh, they're here thanks to our panelist, uh, John Sangmeister. Uh, some logistics before we begin, I think you know most of it. Um, if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button at the, usually at the bottom of the screen, sometimes at the top of your screen, um, not the chat, but the uh, Q&A, and we will try to get to all questions um, when we are done. Um, you will also hear, of course, first from our principal speaker, Rich DeMullen, and then from five panelists who live to tell us today about their disasters at sea, all of which could have ended very differently if not for their preparations, uh, quick thinking, and quick actions. You're going to hear about fire flooding, smashing into unseen objects, um, mass toppling, a, a rudder stock uh, gone wild, wiping out everything in sight, and you'll hear about rescue as well. Um, before the panelists address you, uh, my friend Rich DeMullen will opine on what you can do to avoid disaster and then what you do when it strikes. It's my pleasure to introduce him. Uh, his seafaring experience is vast and he's just the person you want to listen to uh, with regard to these frightening matters that we will address today. Rich has competed in uh, four America's Cup campaigns, six transatlantic races, 25 Newport Bermuda races, and Transpac Sydney Hobart Fastnet races. He's also campaigned double-handed for 20 years, including in 2003 with Rich Wilson aboard his 53-foot trimaran, Great American Two. Together, they beat the time for Hong Kong to New York of the clipper ship Sea Witch that uh, had stood for 154 years by finishing in 72 days, which today, almost 20 years later, still stands as the record for the passage. For the past 25 years, Rich has organized hands-on safety at sea seminars for the Storm Trisel that have trained over 5,000 young people and 2,000 adults in seamanship, leadership, and safety including man overboard recovery procedures. Besides the Storm Triso for which he served as Commodore, Rich belongs to the New York Yacht Club, the CCA, the Royal Ocean Racing Club and Larchmont Yacht Club. In his professional life outside yachting, Rich is involved in shipping and has headed companies that own and operate tankers and bulk carriers globally. He's a consummate volunteer. His list of charitable positions is too long to enumerate here but it does bear mentioning that he was longtime chair of the Siemens Church Institute of New York and New Jersey. And so here is Rich DeMullen. Rich, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you everybody who's helped uh, put this together. It's a real uh, team effort. Uh, and it's great to have so many of you on uh, this morning or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, uh, we have a huge group of people here. I think if we hadn't named this uh, Don't Give Up the Ship, about five disastrous voyages. If we titled it, you know, five problem-free voyages, not many of you would be here. Uh, but we have some pretty exciting things to talk about uh, uh, the panelists when they come on, and it's very impressive uh, how they handle their situations. Uh, in presenting damage control and anything else I, like, I do with safety at sea, I always like to draw on history because I think some of the lessons there uh, really create lasting impressions, and uh, you can remember the key principles that they uh, present, uh, as opposed to worrying about how you use a single tool or something. The principles are more important. So I'll uh, start with uh, the famous battle in the War of 1812, uh, uh, when the uh, British ship Shannon defeated the US uh, uh, frigate uh, Chesapeake. Uh, there's a lot of lessons in here. Uh, uh, captain James Lawrence was a very heroic character, the American captain. Uh, he and his ship Chesapeake had been blockaded in Boston for uh, almost a year. And the British squadron outside Boston uh, included a frigate named the Shannon. Uh, the crew of the Chesapeake did not have 
did not have the availability of practice and much training while the Shannon was on duty and very highly trained and also well officered. Uh, but Lawrence wanted to be the hero and go out and do battle. So the British squadron withdrew to a plight distance, leaving the Shannon in Chesapeake. And uh, early in, in the battle, uh, the Shannon uh, uh, knocked out the steering of the Chesapeake, which then got caught in irons and started to slowly sail backwards, like in this picture. So she lost her steering. They couldn't repair it in time. And the Shannon was able to kind of cross the T and rake the Chesapeake, creating mayhem on board. And uh, Lawrence, in his dying words, said, don't give up the ship. Uh, the lesson here is not actually don't give up the ship because she was hopeless and they had to give it up. But the lesson is one in training, preparation, assessing the situation, changing your plan uh, while there's still time. Uh, you don't follow through on a plan when circumstances change. And uh, so uh, these are some of the lessons that come out of this. But the don't give up the ship uh, does have some value. And uh, the next two examples will show you how never giving up uh, uh, and having the attitude that you can succeed is really important. It's a real key part of damage control. We all know Serena Shackleton and his, and his group went down to the Antarctic uh, continent in 1914 to go to the pole and across. Uh, the ship got caught in the ice, crushed, and they had to drag their boats across ice flows to Elephant Island. Then he had to get in the James Caird and sail a thousand miles across the Drake Passage for help. But the key here is that Shackleton made a lot of plans. He adjusted them. He was honest with his men. He was a great communicator. He was empathetic to his men. He understood the problems and dealt with them. Uh, and he, he was always optimistic. And uh, a, a professor at Harvard Business School did a study of, of Shackleton to use in, for leadership. And uh, uh, she drew from the diaries that the men with Shackleton kept while they were in Antarctica. And these diaries, instead of being depressed and sad and feeling sorry for themselves, were optimistic. And the first officer of the endurance, Shackleton made many contingency plans in great detail while still remaining flexible. He wasn't afraid to change his mind as the situation warranted. Or the captain, Captain Worsley of the endurance. No matter what turns up, he's always ready to alter his plans and make fresh ones. And in the meantime, laugh, joke, and keep everyone's spirits up. He inspires optimism in everyone. And for those of us who go to sea, these are great characteristics uh, because uh, no plan is left unchanged by reality. Another example of, uh, of not giving up and uh, being self-reliant. And this is really important because so many people go to sea nowadays not properly prepared, just assuming they get on their sat phone or light off the EPIRB and somebody comes and rescues them. And uh, while you want to have those capabilities if you get in severe trouble, the attitude of going to sea has to be that I'm gonna prepare, I'm gonna make it, my crew's gonna get trained, I'm responsible. And, uh, uh, and if we have to, we'll call for help, but if we don't have to, we'll deal with our own problem. And this is the essence of damage control is dealing with what happens without outside assistance. Uh, so Robin Knox Johnson, first human being to sail solo around the world 313 days. I pulled this from his book, uh, a, a World of My Own, and it's kind of cool because he was in the Southern Ocean and the steering wasn't working. His self-steering had been wiped out. He was exhausted and he thought the boat was gonna sink. And he's down below and, and for some irrational reason, I also thought of poetry and the words of Robert Service Ballads, the quitter. When you're lost in the wild and you're scared as a child and death looks you bang in the eye and you're sore as a boil, it's according to Hoyle to cock your revolver and die. But the code of a man says fight all you can and self-dissolution is barred. In hunger and woe, oh, it's easy to blow. It's hell, sir, for breakfast, that's hard. And then he goes on to say that, he th I think that saved me. It brought me up with a jolt. What was I doing getting the life raft out? The boat hadn't gone yet. I hadn't really tried everything. I went back on deck and stood watching the sea for a while. This character was slowly changing. The huge Southwest seas were dominating now and the old northerly seas had been knocked flat by the wind. Sue Haley was lying beam on this large sea. Now if I could get her around to lie with the sea, she might be all right. And he went on to uh, be the first person to sail around the world. So all this put together uh, really links damage control and leadership. And for all the talk we've had of leadership, and we're doing a lot of work on that nowadays, how it applies to damage control may be the, the tightest, strongest linkage, uh, because that's when you have problems. And uh, first, leadership is about responsibility and accountability. 
you can share responsibility. Uh, the, you know, the skipper can delegate different responsibilities to the crew and share it. That's good. That's what ought to be done. But at the end of the day, the skipper or owner is accountable for what happens. And this is what uh, all of us who go to sea know, uh, our organizations, and uh, it's being accountable and responsible, which uh, gives you the uh, which gives you the burden of preparing, creating a team, picking the right people, training them, uh, preparing to respond to a crisis, but being optimistic to uh, ensure good outcomes. Uh, another aspect is train the way you fight, fight the way you train. This is how the Marines say it. You could say, uh, uh, train the way you sail, sail the way you train. And the point here is if you don't practice uh, before you go to sea on the voyage, uh, you're never going to do a good job when the incident occurs at sea. So training and training uh, in the proper way, and we'll get more into this later. This is everything from practicing a man overboard to uh, uh, to preparing for uh, fires and, uh, and uh, uh, flooding and having uh, drills on board, knowing where equipment is, where the through holes are, uh, but basically being prepared to do it when the real thing happens. Uh, in the crisis, uh, a, a good thing to remember is stop, think, act. Man overboard, you do a quick stop. At that point, you don't turn right around and go back for the person in the water because if you have a four person watch, one's in the water, one's pointing, one's steering, you only got one guy to go around the boat, sailing the boat. You got to wait for the off watch to come up. You got to make a plan and coordinate how are you going to go back under power, under sail, jib down, jib up, depends on your boat. So stop, think, and then act. Uh, now, if you're prepared, that stopping is only momentary, but usually yeah, you need that moment to assess what's going on. The crisis you plan for or the crisis you did not plan for, uh, and then ones that are kind of in between. But if you practice for the ones you plan for, you're better equipped to deal with the ones you didn't plan for. You can change the plan, reset goals. And net net, you don't think Captain Lawrence, don't give up the ship and die and take your crew with you. Uh, you think Shackleton, figure out a way to survive. Uh, Admiral Rickover, uh, the father of nuclear Navy, really said better than anybody, what is responsibility and what is accountability? Responsibility is a unique concept. It can only reside in here in a single individual. You may share it with others, but your portion is not diminished. You may delegate it, but it's still with you. You may disclaim it, but you cannot divest yourself of it. Unless you can point the finger at the man who's responsible when something goes wrong, then you never had anybody really responsible. Responsibility can be shared. Accountability cannot. Being accountable not only means being responsible for something, but also ultimately answerable for actions. So a, a skipper of a boat, usually a skipper and owner are the same, so keep it simple. He is the accountable person, the responsible person, he or she. Uh, if you have a different owner and the skipper is a different person, you've got to have that resolved before you go to see who's really in charge. Moving on to damage control itself. These are the damages we'll be talking about. Uh, the Sydney Hobart race uh, from 2015, this was not the big disaster in 1998, but it was rough. There were 31 boats that retired and this is the uh, array of, uh, of reasons why. And it's interesting. You got the, the set mainsails are very vulnerable. People don't put adequate spreader patches on. They uh, don't have strong enough reef points. Uh, Swept back spreaders are really hell on a mainsail when you ease the main out. Uh, you had five that involved loss of steering, three loss of rig, three hull damage, two ele engine electrical, and nine miscellaneous. So uh, damage control covers all this, uh, broadly speaking, and, uh, and it, it had a big impact in this particular race. Uh, the three rules, uh, the rule of P, preparation, practice, prevention. Preparation and practice before the uh, going to sea, prevention while you're at sea by looking around, inspecting, uh, making sure you're anticipating, situational awareness, all, all those things. Checklists are a big help. Uh, I like to do it by department, you know, rigging, sales, engine, et cetera. And you do an inventory and you think of what you may need for tools and spares, and that helps you get organized. An inspection list. You know, what you like to inspect before you go to sea or while you're at sea. Heavy weather checklist. When you know heavy weather's <laughs> coming, what do you do? You know, cook some extra food, charge your batteries, 
uh, lash things down, get as much sleep as you can, get the right equipment ready. Stowage chart should be posted so everybody knows where everything is. And then crew assignments and specific skills uh, that you like to have among your crew. This came from John Bonds, uh, uh, who really was the father of safety at sea in this country. Uh, while at the Naval Academy, uh, right after the fastener race, he started uh, safety at sea. And then when he moved to be the president of US Sailing, he continued it. And these were his uh, bullet points. And uh, the adapt and prevail particularly sticks with you. And that's really the Shackleton approach. Everybody should have one of these posted in their boat. It should be accurate, should uh, label what's important. Uh, I think Les Crane mentioned in his, he, he, he couldn't read his without his bifocals or something. So make sure it's actually readable for those who need to use it. What are the only two reasons to abandon ship? When you think about abandoning ship, rarely do people bring it to the point of, there's only two reasons to do it. Now, am I prepared for both? These are the two I come up with, flooding and fire. I can't imagine why else you'd leave the boat. Uh, unless you're really near shore and you can't stand the people on board and you jump over and swim ashore, but flooding and fire. And what's interesting is uh, the approach to the two really is parallel because this is our, our uh, abandoned ship bill from Carina. Uh, and this is a real one. Uh, the abandoned ship, the process is similar. So we didn't distinguish totally between fire and flood. The on watch basically deals with everything on deck, the dousing head sails, preparing the rafts and ditch kits, spare water, EPIRB, VHF, et cetera. Uh, putting the boat in the correct aspect to help the guys who are either fighting the flooding, fighting the fire, get the hole out of the water uh, or uh, reduce the apparent wind, whatever it is that helps the, uh, the fire or flood fighting. The off watch down below is in the right position to fight the flood or the fire. Uh, and uh, they're there, let them do it. Uh, they're not uh, it bulked up by their uh, foul weather gear and their PFDs. And if you're fighting a fire, you do not, do not want to wear a foul weather gear. The heat will melt it to your skin. You want to wear cotton, wool, whatever, or nothing. So uh, this on-watch, off-watch allocation uh, for our thinking works well. Um, and navigator the mayday. Uh, on the bottom, it happens that on Karina, we have two rafts. So we assign people to uh, two rafts. But the key here isn't what Karina did. It's you need to make up your own that works on your boat with your crew and your equipment. Fire. Uh, a lot of causes for fire. And uh, you'll hear about some of them uh, later uh, from Tom. Uh, prevention, good housekeeping, inspections, uh, checking your fuel lines, replacing as needed, particularly uh, any of the end fittings, propane equipment, lines, electrical gear, uh, proper usage and procedures and maintenance. <laughs> this can help prevent. And uh, uh, my, as my dad always said, keeping your bilge clean really is important too for a lot of different aspects of damage control, including having your pumps work. A uh, Couple of rules in fire. Uh, when we do the firefighting at the Storm Trisel Hands-On Seminars, we have uh, some uh, volunteer firemen in our membership and they've kind of acquainted us with a lot of this from their real experience. There's a two minute rule. Uh, the view by the professionals is if you can't control fire in two minutes, your chances are very slim. So that's why you immediately initiate abandoned ship. Uh, as we get, when we get to the quiz, you'll have to deal with the question, when do you put your raft in the water? Uh, we'll come to that later. But uh, if you can't control the fire in two minutes, the odds are you're not going to be able to. Doesn't mean you abandon ship in two minutes, but this put lights, lights a fire under your butt to actually get going with fighting the fire. And a fire uh, will, double every, uh, will double every minute in size uh, if it isn't restrained. And it's got the potential of personal injury and death. It's, a, it's the scariest one. And if there's a fire on board, uh, an immediate May Day is appropriate. I don't think in a, in a, unless it's just a tiny little fire in the stove, you know, you can put out with a little bit of water. But if it's any real fire, uh, I'd go with the May Day and then withdraw the May Day later if, if you're fine. The different extinguishers, uh, uh, these are it's all by the book. Uh, an ABC on a sailboat is the handiest to have. It's good for everything. Flares, got to get them over the side. The Coast Guard uh, requires these, uh, this array of types and, and sizes of fire extinguishers. And uh, 
net net, I think it's too few and they're too small. Uh, when, if you've used a fire extinguisher, you definitely ought to do it at a hands-on seminar or, or even in your backyard. Uh, you realize how, sh how short a time it actually uh, uh, works for. So you wanna have larger capacity, more of them than the requirements. Uh, at a minimum, uh, we, we suggest four uh, spread out through the boat, one on deck. Uh, one in the engine box is really helpful. Some engine boxes get so warm, the automatic ones just keep releasing like on my boat. In that case, there's another solution we'll touch on in a moment. The fire port. Uh, you do not want to open a hatch to the engine box uh, if there's any suspicion of a fire or you, the whole fire can flare up. Uh, so if you don't have an automatic extinguisher in the box, uh, or even if you do and you find you need to supplement it, these fire ports just screw into the side of the box and you, you poke the no nozzle of the fire extinguisher through the little diaphragm in the middle and you can do it. You can fight the fire from outside the box without opening the box. These cost about 20 bucks at West Marine. Uh, what to do uh, if there's a fire. Uh, initialize the abandoned ship as we discussed, fight the fire fast. Uh, in terms of techniques, uh, ideally you work in pairs with one crew behind the other hand on the shoulder. And uh, this helps if there's bad visibility or if the first person uh, passes out, uh, it's the safest way. And you stay low when you fight a fire because there's more oxygen and less heat down low. Uh, the acronym is PASS, to use the fire extinguisher, you pull the pin, you aim at the base of the fire, squeeze the trigger and sweep back and forth and uh, keep going until the fire extinguisher is empty. You wanna make sure that fire is out and always make sure there's an escape route. You stay between the fire and the exit. Uh, if you have an open forward hatch, you can fight the fire in the galley from forward. If you don't have a forward hatch, uh, uh, you better stay between the fire and the main hatch. Uh, on deck, uh, I think reducing apparent wind would, would probably be helpful for most firefighters. After the fire's out, you assess the damage, you post a watch to make sure it doesn't start up again, and you decide whether you need to cancel the May Day and then the cleanup. My nav station, all the phone numbers I would need, I have them loaded into the, the, the handheld uh, uh, sat phone and anyway, but I like to have everything posted in case I need it. Moving on to flooding. Again, a lot of causes, the, you know, a lot, the interesting ones, lightning strike can blow out your through hole fittings, depending on how your boat's grounded. Uh, back flooding on pumps, you'll hear about some of these, uh, that uh, all these are possible ways of flooding. And therefore, when you think of your equipment on board, your, your damage control equipment, you'd like to be able to deal with any one of these. Uh, interesting one, the rudder post failure, uh, one of the hardest ones to deal with, you'll hear about this uh, from John Sangmeister later. An idea of how much water comes in, depending on how big a hole and how deep under the water. Uh, a good reason why you want to get the hole as high as, as high up as you can by leaning the boat over, tacking if you have to. Uh, but uh, you, your goal here is to uh, slow down the inflow. A remarkable few uh, sailboats have hit containers, but there's more containers going over the side of container ships. Now they have these mega ships and a couple hundred more were lost this week off Japan. And if they float, uh, they float because of the package goods inside the bubble wrap and they float flush with the water. Even though they're full of water, they still float uh, because they're cargo and uh, it's hard to see. Uh, I don't know what you can do about it, but if you hit it, you'll know it and it'll be probably catastrophic damage. All your uh, hoses should be double clamped, stainless steel marine grade with the two uh, clamps facing opposite directions with the screw part on opposite sides. Uh, four deck hatches are notorious for leaking. On my boat, we had to put these aluminum reinforcing uh, beams around the side and we never had another leak. So to prevent flooding, you really need 100% accessibility to your interior hull if you're gonna fight uh, hull damage. And that's, not so hard on racing boats, but it's a bitch on a cruising boat. And if you have a cruising boat, you probably need a big crowbar because you're going to have to remove uh, furniture if you need if you have a chance of getting to the uh, damage area. Uh, your through hole diagram helps. Plugs tied in. Uh, the kind of plugs you buy in the store, or the wooden ones, are usually too hard of wood. If you ever try to hammer them into a hole. Uh, you better keep your, your head clear of the sledge because it's going to bounce back and hit you in the face. 
uh, uh, some people go out and take buy the softest pine they can and make their own. Uh, Pre-departure inspection, double clamping, build clean, test your pumps. And uh, to extend your batteries and the air intake from the engine can be high up, the better. Uh, so they operate while flooded. I know there's a limit how high you want your batteries. Good practices uh, for uh, dealing with flooding. Uh, should you have a problem, uh, checking the bilge and keeping batteries charged, lookouts, avoid groundings, extreme spinnaker douse. Uh, you go in major ocean races, high speed boats going downwind, it's easy to stick your bow right through a wave. Uh, taking spinnakers down the foredeck is a very risky thing at sea. And uh, you have an open hatch, you have three, four, or five people up there, the bow's down. Uh, you're asking for trouble. Eventually, you're going to have a disaster. The letterbox where you pull the spinnaker in between the boom and the uh, foot of the mainsail is foolproof, and you never have to have anybody forward to the mast. Uh, that's the, we have videos on our website, Storm Trisol, and UK has it on their site. If you haven't done a letterbox and you're going to see, it's a good thing to know. Uh, I always like to, like to lock the foredeck hatch if it's not being used and uh, make sure it's watertight. And also ports. Uh, Ted Turner used to say the most efficient bailing mechanism is a man with a bucket and water up to his knees. Uh, and uh, this guy, of course, had better equipment than a bucket. He looks very calm for a guy who's got water sloshing around in his Vondi uh, Open 60. Uh, but he's dealing with it. In the last Vondi four years ago, Thomas Riant's boat broke. It somehow didn't fold up, but it was cracked in the, around his perimeter. He made it to Australia. This year he was fourth. Um, what do you do when the flooding begins, when you've identified it? Uh, buying time is what you really, the, the whole game is. Anything you can do to slow the leak. And that buys you time to come up with either the abandoned ship if you need to do it, but also to remedy the situation. So the attitude of the boat, uh, both in terms of slowing her down and getting her healed the correct way, some balance of that, uh, making sure the crew is not uh, trapped, uh, get the engine started immediately and the electrical pumps working, uh, put out a mayday if you have any uh, doubt about your ability to survive, initialize your abandoned ship procedures, but uh, do not put the raft over the side until you're actually ready to abandon ship because it can blow away, it'll inflate and blow away or get damaged. Uh, so uh, again, buy time. Uh, buy time and get the water out. In I carried years ago this giant Edson pump that was mounted on a wooden board that had a handle of almost as tall as me. And uh, I had it on board the first year we double-handed Bermuda and, and finally it dawned on me, who the hell is gonna operate this thing? There's only two of us on board dealing with the flooding and, the, uh, and saving ourselves. So I uh, became a real fan of electrical pumps. And uh, I, th I think that uh, you've got to have huge pump capacity on board. The most you can fit in your boat and uh, Les will have a few ideas for you later on. Keeping the water out, uh, if the foam plugs are great. And uh, uh, fathering is where you, where you pull, put a sail over the side and, you, and the sail presses against the hull and the water pressure uh, kind of seals the hull. Uh, Patriot, the America's Cup boat a month ago, used that. They put one of the sails over the bow to cover that four foot square hull, that and a bunch of pumps and they saved the boat. But fathering only works forward to your keel because you can't get the sail pressed up against the hull with the keel and the rudder as obstructions. But if the damage is forward to the keel, taking a small sail, a tri storm jib is easiest, uh, has a huge impact on the, uh, the flooding and it buys you time. Uh, of course, you can't be sailing forward when you're doing this. You have to be sitting in the water, dead in the water. Patches, lead sheets, great because you can uh, mold it to the curved shape of the hull, all the epoxies. Uh, Nothing like a nothing works like a good pair of two by fours if you have to shore up a, a patch against a hole, and uh, the Navy uses a combination of two by fours and wooden wedges to uh, uh, to lock in patches and and structure. Uh, really handy. And there's nothing on board that duplicates a two by four, uh, uh, whereas you can duplicate a lot of things, ripping out bunk boards and things. Two by four is a two by four. It's nice to store one in a convenient place. Big wrench for the stuffing box. A lot of boats don't carry a wrench big enough or the right shape to reach the nut on your stuffing box. Uh, West Marine has this uh, tub of stay afloat. And I, I was, I was kind of skeptical, but we tested it at a safety and sea seminar and it's like putty. 
and uh, you just smear it into a crack. And it's amazing how effective this is. And uh, after using it, uh, we then pulled it out, shoved it back in the can and used it again. And it's amazing material. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have epoxies, but a can of Stafford really is helpful. Uh, the, the plug, uh, we make sure that our biggest plug is bigger than the through hull for the rudder post uh, in case we had to jam it in there. Again, that's not an easy thing to do, but you, you wanna have at least a plug big enough. Uh, manual pump in the cabin should be a good strong one, well located so you can use it. Uh, I put a, a high powered uh, electrical pump on my floorboards because I know the water is gonna be over those boards almost immediately in a modern boat with no bilge. Okay, moving on to the loss of a rudder. This is really tough. Uh, uh, Joshua Slocum on spray might have sailed around the world having it steer itself uh, with no, no autopilot because of the long keel and the way she balanced. This is not gonna happen on a modern boat. Uh, so uh, you've got a, a real challenge if you lose the rudder. Uh, when you're preparing for the voyage or race, in the case of my example, you've got to decide is your goal in having an alternate steering method uh, to just satisfy an inspector, or do you want something that really works? And I would suggest you want something that really works. There's various principles that you can employ after you've lost a rudder. It's a combination of these that, that works because you might rig some, uh, some kind of jury rudder, but you still have to deal with your sail plan. And uh, you reduce canvas so the, so the pressures are, are lower. Uh, and, uh, you know, depending on how many crew you have, you're going to have to do sail trim changes. And if, if you have full sails up, you're going to wear yourselves out. But reducing canvas, balancing the fore and aft of the sails, uh, uh, putting a storm jib up as a stace on the fore triangle so you can balance your jib and main and then use the storm jib being backed in the fore triangle or brought to leeward uh, as a way to swing the bow left and right. Uh, a lot of people have used this to pretty good effect. And then, of course, the great method is the is the drogue steering using the Gale Rider drogue. And Mike Heareth had made a video of it on his uh, Swan 44. Uh, and, again, and, and the key of, of all these is, depending on your crew, you're, you're usually manpower limited. So there's certain methods that just don't work when you have to have a lot of manpower. So if you're cruising uh, or if you're double handing, uh, you've got to do something that works for your boat. And the only way to know it is to try it. This came out of some old book where they they put the drogue and they put it on the port and starboard uh, quarters of the boat and it doesn't work because you just like you know when you try to tow a boat if you tow it from the stern your stern you can't steer uh the drogue steering that mike Keyworth came up with brings the drogue attachments midships not to the stern this uh pretty salty guy uh, my experience with trying to put poles out the stern is they don't work and they break it can be made to work but it's a very hard way to actually effectively steer a boat especially when you have uh, uh, any kind of freeboard to deal with. Uh, this guy had an idea, but that little rudder is never gonna last. Uh, great pintle gudgeon setup on this Whitbread 60, but if you've ever tried to put a laser or a sunfish rudder back in its gudgeons after it pops out, imagine trying to put something in a boat like this with a boat moving in a seaway. Uh, this is a cool idea. If you can follow my cursor, uh, this is a Trip 37 sailed by the college kids from Sacred Heart in Connecticut. And uh, Dave White, their coach, in the vineyard race, they broke uh, most of their rudder off. Uh, they managed to somehow motor into Block Island. And uh, to, go, to sail home, they couldn't do anything about the rudder. So what they did, though, was they uh, uh, took a two by six and strapped it to their transom as a stabilizing fin. It doesn't steer, it just stabilized the stern and their little rudder was effective. On my boat, uh, we, want to, we want to stay competitive if we lose our main rudder. So we built a, a trunk, like a centerboard trunk from the cockpit sole to the bottom. And we have a, an emergency rudder that goes through and the top part of it is a block and the part that protrudes uh, rotates. So it's not a daggerboard, it's actually a rudder. And we've steered with it, it works. But uh, this is before we knew of Mike Heareth's drogue steering. I'm not sure I would have gone to the bother if I knew how good the drogue steering worked. There's a Mike Heareth's setup. It's a Gale Rider drogue. Other drogues might work, but the Gale Rider is very easy and effective. It also duplicates uh, as a man overboard retrieval. You can 
hanging on a hire and scoop up a man overboard in the water who might be injured. It's not going to be comfortable, but uh, it's a way to get him aboard. The, it's the drogue. It's a, a, a piece of chain. There's a good swivel in there. And then at the bottom, you can see two spinnaker sheets. One led to the um, uh, each beam of the boat. So at, at beam at the center of pivot, basically almost just a little uh, more than halfway aft on each rail, there's a snatch block. And uh, the spinnaker sheets go through those snatch blocks, port and starboard, and back to cockpit winches. And when you tug on one, the boat turns. And it steers beautifully under power, under sail, beating, reaching. Running is a little hard for running. They, just, they finally had to drop the mainsail and just set up uh, one or two jibs. We'll switch to uh, rig damage. It starts at the mast step. Uh, uh, if you don't want the mast leaping up out of the boat when something breaks and then the, the butt crashing down on the deck, crushing somebody, then going over the side and putting a hole in your boat, uh, you need to have the bottom of your mast secured. And this uh, welded piece uh, uh, is our uh, big tab in our mast step, uh, which we can uh, use as a, a tie down from the mast. This is required in virtually every ocean race. Prevention, uh, again, like everything else, uh, inspections. And uh, uh, in tuning the boat up, lee shrouds that flop around when you're uh, uh, on the wind uh, are not good because anything that shakes and flops around tends to get loose or, uh, or wear out. Uh, and not many racing boats have this problem, but uh, loose lee shrouds is not great. Uh, you don't have to go up the mast when you're at sea. You can take binoculars, just look up your mast, and you can see things very clearly. Uh, Want to do the walk around each watch, a bosun chair and weather permits, good sailing practices, and replacing standing rigging from time to time. It varies depending on the use of a boat. I've heard everything from 10 years to 20 years. Uh, proper use of a bosun chair. Uh, either way, they should be in the form of a, of a harness type style with the, the uh, safety belt on it and the and uh, either one of these works well. Uh, helmet is, is important so you don't get knocked out, a dinghy vest so you don't break ribs. And uh, you can have a bowline to tie the hired in, don't trust the shackle. Uh, you could also have a downhaul from the uh, uh, going down to the deck uh, for further security. So an approach to damage control is like first aid. Uh, you come on a victim, what's the first thing you do? You know, when you assess the situation and you look for you know, uh, something fatal that you can deal like uh, arterial bleeding. You don't worry about stitching the wound till later. So you have an immediate response and you have a permanent response. And with damage control, it's the same thing. Often there's a moment where your response to the incident can prevent further damage. An example is you're sailing up on port tack and all of a sudden you hear a bang and your port lower shroud goes, where you see a fold, a spreader fold or something goes wrong. Uh, if you can tack fast enough and get the load on the other side of the rig, uh, you can save the mass and set up a, a jury rig. Uh, it sounds crazy, but it works. And uh, we did it on my boat on the, uh, on the way back from Bermuda. Uh, what, you, what you have here is uh, uh, my lower shroud turnbuckle broke, it's blown 40. We have a double reef main. And my watch captain, Rich Feely from Boston on deck, uh, I heard the explosion and the second after it happened, he's screaming at the helmsman attack and we tacked within seconds, the mast bent but didn't break. And uh, basically we were able to secure the remaining part of the turnbuckle and lead a line aft to a cockpit winch. And, and uh, uh, we, we also took a hired out to the side and they were able to sail home. What happens if the head stay fails? What do you do? run off, put the load on from the stern, not uh, uh, from forward. And you keep your jib up because it's a lot for the jib keeping the mast up at that point with your head stay gone. And, uh, and then eventually rig hires. Uh, you're running down when your back stay fails. What do you do? Luff up, drop head sails, get rid of the, the anything pulling the mast forward and trim your main sheet and vang as hard as you can. The main sheet, the leech of the main, will keep the mast up uh, if you can get it trimmed hard and super tight. And then you can bring high to the stern. And these all work. Uh, I know cases where both back stays, head stays, and in my case, 
the uh, lower shroud and, and rigs were saved. Um, don't expect you to read this, but again, all this will be posted. But this is a matrix we put together over the years, uh, started by my dad and Steve Van Dyke and I finished it in the Navy. And, uh, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of document that keeps changing depending on the boat and technology. But the key is the event that occurs is on the left column. Uh, Lee shroud or spread or looser damage. Media response, uh, stay on present tech because it's the Lee side. Uh, quick repair, permanent repair. But you take every major incident that could occur, including several with a rudder, flooding and fire, uh, and you create this table and the crew studies it. You go out and practice it. And it really works because you're breaking a problem into sub problems. Event occurs, immediate response, quick repair, permanent repair. Okay, so the mass is gone. Uh, you, you weren't able to save it. An interesting uh, thing on this picture is you can see the broken part of the mast uh, is suspended by internal halyards. Internal halyards have kind of changed what happens when a mast breaks because the parts tend to stay linked together. Uh, and this can be an advantage because it, it makes it more likely you'll be able to retrieve parts of the rig uh, for a jury rig. So what do you do when the mask goes over the side? The first thing is to do a crew roll call because there's a real good chance that somebody could be trapped under the rig or knocked overboard. And uh, you wanna make sure all your crew are there. Uh, the mask isn't gonna go anywhere, uh, but you wanna make sure your crew is all okay. Uh, then you have your second decision. Uh, and you gotta make this decision fairly quickly because if the mast is hanging over the side, it possibly could be damaging the hull it could even, if there's a, a broken butt end of the mast over there, be pounding at your hull and put a hole in it. So you got to take a quick look and decide, are you going to save the rig or cut it away or pull it in close to the boat and stabilize and then make a decision? But what you don't want to do is to have the rig damage the hull. And uh, then the, you've got the technique, okay, if you decide to cut it away or you're going to cut parts of it away, how do you do it? And... Uh, uh, this is why you have a drift pin and a sledgehammer so you can hammer out the clevis pins. You have a, a rig cutter, a bolt cutter, hacksaws, with lots of blades. But uh, uh, from what I've seen, uh, most of these rig cutters are really, uh, are, 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 they, they're hard tested to try to cut a uh, uh, rod rigging. Rod rigging really is hard. So what we tend, what we have on board is an angle grinder. And it's not in lieu of all these things, but it's a hell of a lot better. And I'm, I'm holding it up to the camera uh, here. Uh, it's a great tool. Uh, they can get wet. Uh, there are waterproof ones, which are much more expensive, but having one of these $80 units on board with a bunch of wheels and test it out on some old rigging. And it's amazing. It cuts it like butter. Less than 10 seconds, you can get through almost any rod. Now here's a, a really important thing, and as in releasing the rigging, do you uh, do the loose rigging or the tight rigging first? That's on the quiz. Uh, you got to think about it. Uh, if you do the tight rigging and you cut it, what's going to happen? There's going to be a giant resetting of the rig. Something's everything's going to move, and and uh, it could be kind of a catastrophic movement of the rig and and really hurt people. Uh, loose rigging has no load. Get rid of the loose rigging first, and then. Uh, work your way up to finally the tightest one last. And you got to keep the crew clear. Angle grinder. Trader did a good job. They used uh, uh, their, uh, uh, they saved part of the mass. They're using their reaching strut. Uh, they're putting a jib up sideways. Uh, they're using a spinnaker pole forward for the tack. And uh, they could even have gone further and used their boom. Uh, but uh, here they are, they're sailing. I think it was the transpac race. Uh, Conrad Coleman, four years ago, uh, a couple of thousand miles from, uh, I think, 2,000 miles from the finish line, his mass broke. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the jury rig he put together. He ran out of food. He didn't have any food for the last six days, but he, was, he finished, and the French uh, gave him a hell of a welcome. He never gave, he didn't give up, and he was creative. Uh, this is my favorite. Uh, there's, there's, nobody's done a repair job like this guy's done. In the uh, Vondi Globe race south of Australia in the uh, Southern Ocean, his rig went over the side. Uh, 
He pulled it all aboard, managed to set up a little jury rig, uh, sailed to a lagoon in New Zealand, dropped anchor, no help from anybody else, spent a week in the lagoon. He, he, he uh, uh, glassed and repaired his rig uh, and uh, re-stepped it himself and went on to finish the race in 127 days, which wasn't such a bad time in those days. Uh, damage control kit, this will be on the, this will be posted, but basically it's, it's your whole array of everything from the, the two by fours. I like the lead sheet pre-drilled around the perimeter, rubber sheets, collision mats, lots of life caulk in 5200. Life caulk is really good stuff. Uh, it sets in water. Uh, it's not as strong as 5200, but hell of a lot more user friendly. Uh, and uh, the, the various tools, uh, including your power packs, the drills, the angry grinder, and lots of batteries charged at the beginning of the race. And uh, uh, we, one boat, not in this group, this panel, did have fires started by uh, uh, batteries that were left to tumble around in a heated uh, storage space. So they don't, you don't want them to be uh, flying around. This is what our kit looks like. Uh, we have actually three plastic boxes and everything's in them and the boxes are labeled. That's the rolled up lead sheet. You can be with a, a rubber mallet, you can easily hammer it to mold to any shape inside the boat. Just slobber all the life caulk or 5200 on it, lay it in place and just uh, drill through the holes. That was a splint for my spinnaker pole. I don't have a Spinnaker pole, uh, I have a sprit now, but it's a good useful device for any kind of repair like a boom. The complete toolbox. Uh, other equipment, buckets, extinguishers, or, and spare parts for all the different systems. Instruction manuals. Do not rely on a flash drive only for your instruction manuals. A paper manual is really helpful because uh, Somehow you can never find the flash drive or the computer's not working when you need it. Uh, uh, repair kits based on the system. Uh, for each uh, system on board, what kind of repair kit? For a long ocean race, you cannot have enough sticky back, Dacron and Kevlar. You cannot have enough. Uh, some other challenges. I wouldn't say this is totally damage control, but they related to, to uh, uh, I think it's related. Drinking water, independent tanks, don't have them all tied together, and beware of siphoning out of uh, uh, your faucets by, you know, the tank being uphill. Uh, refrigeration, uh, what if it doesn't work? Do you have enough food that uh, you can survive without relying on what's refrigerated? And then preparing for blackout sailing. And this happens eventually to a lot, almost every boat. That's why you have your pocket GPS and flashlights and lots of batteries. And with double handers and cruisy, cruisers with no autopilot, you're gonna wear out. So as some backup uh, steering system is helpful. And uh, a single-handed nutcase on the West Coast who wrote a fabulous book, uh, Real Extreme Thinking, invented this. And it's a shock cord with a rope and then shock cord on the other side of the boat. And it's just wrapped a few turns around the tiller. So you can grab the tiller and just push it uh, right or left because the shock cord gives, and then you can reset the rope a tiny bit to tug it to inward or leeward. And this is a remarkable device if you balance your sails. It's really remarkable. On a steering wheel, you can, you can kind of do the same thing by doing it to top spoke, but it's more effective on a rudder, a tiller, sorry. Uh, drills, if you're going to be uh, uh, going to see, you need to practice all the things we talked about or, or at least, you know, walkthroughs, uh, you know, try to use a fire extinguisher or test all your pumps, envision, envisage, envision different damages and how you'll deal with it. Practice some drills. Uh, make sure that, 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 that everybody on board knows how to use the VHF and that at least three or four know how to use the single sideband and the, uh, the satellite uh, phone, uh, if you have a single sideband. Uh, go loft uh, when you can, uh, replace equipment, parts, uh, inventories, and then really practiced emergency steering. You cannot have enough crew education. So that's it for uh, uh, the presentation on the PowerPoint. Uh, thank you for putting up with it. It's a lot of stuff. It'll all be posted. Uh, but the key takeaway is you got to 
prepare and practice with your own crew for your own boat. And what you do has to work for you. And uh, you can't just rely on someone else's procedure. You can build on it, but you've got to come up with your own. And at this point, I'm going to turn this back uh, to David to uh, bring on the panelists. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Rich. Uh, that was uh, fantastic and all encompassing. Um, our first panelist is uh, Ed Stott and Ed's gonna be speaking uh, to us today uh, from Vero Beach. Uh, he was on his own boat, uh, Swan 441, uh, about 200 nautical miles north of Bermuda. Uh, headed to uh, Newport when his disaster occurred. Um, he is also vastly experienced. He's done 22 trips to and from Bermuda, then transatlantic. Um, his uh, medical training uh, practically puts him at the MD level in terms of uh, courses and accomplishments. And so um, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Ed in a moment. He's the longtime chairman uh, for safety of the uh, Marion Bermuda race. So Ed, if uh, you would go on please. And while you are speaking, I will put up a couple of slides that shows uh, your disaster. Thanks, David. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, this was my own boat and she's a Swan 44. <clears throat> we had spent the winter in the Caribbean and this was the return trip back to Newport. Uh, the crew on board was myself and three others who are well-seasoned sailors and they're well known to me as they've been on many boat deliveries with me. Um, what went wrong? Well, while en route from the Caribbean to Bermuda, we were in a very heavy gale. I know that it was not part of our weather plan when we left uh, the Caribbean, but of course these things do come up. So while in this gale and dead downwind, preventer on the mainsail and the helms person unfortunately get caught into a jibe position. Uh, when this happened, the helms person's natural reaction seemed to be, oh, I, we're, we did the wrong thing here. So I spun the wheel back the other way, consequently creating a double jibe. So the first jibe actually uh, smashed against the working running backstay, which created some level of fatigue, I'm sure. Um, after arriving in Bermuda, we sent one of our crew members aloft with his untrained eye to see if he could see anything that was obvious for damage, which he could not. <clears throat> when we received our weather window and departed Bermuda en route for Newport, we were two days out of Bermuda, and I recall going off watch at 0400 and writing in my logbook that it's been just a delightful sail for the past four hours, and probably the best sail we had since we left Bermuda. Well, soon after, there was this loud bang, and my crewmate, who was off watch with me, thought, that we perhaps had hit a container. Well, I called up to make sure everybody on deck was okay. And you just knew as the skipper what had happened and you knew the rig was gone. I had the crew member grab the life raft, which was in a valise in the forepeak and very accessible, grab the life raft, bring it into the main cabin and drop it at the base of the companionway stairs in the event we needed to take further action and deploy the raft. Now on deck with the crew, uh, pretty weird feeling to be on deck and all you see is horizon and no rig. But um, on deck with the crew, everybody was, as they say, well experienced. They knew um, from our previous drills, departure drills, uh, what we should all be doing. Each person has a particular job that is their task. They knew where the tools were that were necessary to work on getting rid of the rig. With that being said, everybody got, got busy with um, hacksaws, cutting away the furling extrusion, uh, several hammers and drift pins in which to punch out the clevis pins for the shrouds. And for cutting the rod rigging, we had a pair of bolt cutters. Well, many people told me before departure that you'll never cut rod rigging with bolt cutters. Well, 
It's like the scared man with the bucket. It is the best bilge pump. We managed to cut through the rod rigging. And I think in less than 30 minutes time, we had the deck cleared of the entire rig, rig sails, rigging, everything. Part of the problem was um, the rig was trying to punch a, a hole in the uh, side of the hull. So we decided not to save anything, just get everything overboard, clear the decks, and um, let's see if we can manage the boat with this new hole in the starboard side. Well, that worked out okay. And as I said, in about um, less than 30 minutes, I think we had the rig clear. Once the rig was clear, we waited about an hour. We didn't want to fire off the engine at this point and start motoring towards Newport. My fear was that we might catch some part of the rigging or sails in the prop and take a bad situation and turn it into a worse situation. In the meantime, while we're waiting to, for everything to sink below prop level, um, we got on the handheld VHF and called the Pon Pon. There was another sailboat that came to our aid and asked what we need. Well, we need fuel at this point to get ourselves the next 300 miles to Bermuda. And they were not able to spare any fuel, but they did call the Coast Guard who had a ship in the nearby vicinity. So once they joined us, uh, they were very happy to supply us with the needed diesel fuel after they came aboard the boat and inspected the boat to make sure we're not doing things that we shouldn't be doing, like running drugs or that sort of thing. And um, they stayed with us through the night. And in the morning, they refilled our, our fuel cans once again so that we could uh, motor on to, to Bermuda. So if we were to ask ourselves, what do we do right in this situation? Well, the mast step was bolted to the, uh, the keel step uh, so that if it did, try to jump out of the, the keel step, out of the mast step, and uh, someone could become injured, that's not going to happen. Um, other things that we did right was our preparations. Our crew meetings are not just crew meetings, they're assignments. It's an assignment of if it's a man overboard, the young strong guy is handling the life raft. If it's a dismasting, someone's going after those particular tools and someone else is handling something else. So we had assignments well before we had an incident. And I think this was huge in being able to clear the rig. We were very lucky that nobody got hurt. Um, it, it turned out okay. Um, our, as I say, our pre-departure drills were just essential to this whole thing. What are the lessons learned at this point? Well, if it's a rigging question, regardless of where you are, i.e. Bermuda, we do want to employ a professional rigger rather than sending our untrained crew member up the rig to see what he can find. That might be a first start, but in the end result, we should have a professional rigger uh, get up the, the rig and see what's going on. So um, back to you, David or Rich, that's uh, what happened with us on our dismasting. Ed, thank you uh, very much uh, for that. Um, very illuminating and you clearly did all the uh, right things. Um, our next speaker is uh, Len Thibodeau, and uh, Len is speaking to us from North Carolina en route from uh, Florida North. He was not on his own boat. Uh, he was making a professional delivery of a catamaran. Uh, we'll try to get that up for you to see in a moment. And he was about uh, 180 nautical miles southwest of Jamaica, the delivery was from Honduras to the Turks and Caicos. Uh, Len also has uh, considerable experience, uh, Marion Bermuda races, uh, St. Saint Martin to the Galapagos through the Panama Canal. Um, and he's active as rear Commodore with the Blue Water Sailing Club. Um, so Len, uh, over to you, tell, tell us what happened. Thank you very much, David. And thanks Richard for the, uh, you know, this is the second time I've heard this presentation and I still made some notes during Richard's part of the presentation about things I wanna double check on my boat. So anyway, um, three of us were on board the uh, uh, Leopard 46 catamaran and uh, all were rescued uninjured. The entire incident began just before midnight I don't, why those things don't happen in the daytime, nobody knows. It ended with us on board a container ship at, a, at about 0500. So we were lucky that night in that all the resources were uh, aligned. All of our stars were good that night. So it was four days into a windward trip 
uh, just before my midnight watch was to start, when the uh, watch guy noticed that the bilge light was on at the helm. This, every time the bilge pump runs, there was a red light at the helm. That gave us an early warning, but this time it didn't shut off. The delivery captain woke me up and told me we were awash in the starboard hull. It was only a little water at the time, but catamarans don't have a deep bilge, so the water pretty quickly comes up above the floorboards. So that I should start on, I started on the manual bilge pump while he closed, searched for and closed all the seacocks and looked around for any source of water intrusion. He couldn't find any water intrusion in a particular spot. So even with uh, one bilge pump, the one running in the, in the starboard hull and the manual pump, even though with no visible water intrusion, the level was still rising in the hull. So by now we're stopped and it's about 1230. On it's a warm cloudless night. This was the good part, one of the other good parts. Uh, with a full moon, the winds were 12 to 15 uh, east northeast and the seas were running about one to two meters. Uh, we all examined the hull from the deck looking over the side and couldn't see anything. So the captain that night tied himself to the, to the boat and jumped over with a waterproof light and noticed there was uh, scratches and fractures on the outside of the hull and severe delamination into the, to the interior. Now this boat is a double hull with some sort of foam matrix in between. The outer hull was fractured and it was weird that the, uh, the water was able to easily get into the, in between the hulls, but we could never find a particular spot where it was coming in. Now, this could be, as was mentioned earlier in the presentation, that it's not easy to see the entire inside of the hull on a cruising boat, especially a catamaran. So there obviously were places where we couldn't see the source of the water. So the, uh, I know that Rich is uh, in the shipping business, but the damage on the outside of the hull was consistent with hitting a sharp rectangular metal box in the ocean. Uh, although, because we were going to windward under power, the waves are slamming under the salon every third or fourth or fifth wave. And we could never tell one of those poundings from the pounding that might have happened if we had hit something. So we never were really sure when the incident actually happened. Now, we tried uh, taking the uh, sail off and sliding it over the side. And that didn't, that didn't really work. The, the, fracture in the hull was back near the stubby keel of the catamaran. So as was mentioned earlier, it's maybe not possible to seal a hull leak with a sail if it's near the keel. But anyway, that didn't work. So we realized we weren't going to stop the leak. Uh, the captain had brought his own EPIRB and the boat had a spot device. Uh, we set both of those off and while the boat still had power, we powered up the track phone which used main battery power. One of the lessons we, that I learned from this incident is that when you're in a seaway and the cabin is starting to flood, there's a lot of things that float around. It's not that it was a messy boat, but by the time you've lifted up panels, closed seacocks and looked for things and emptied out cabinets, there are things floating around in the water that slosh around and make it very dangerous to be in any water with all this stuff sloshing around. So the worse the flooding gets, the more dangerous it gets down below. So around 1.30 or so, the SAF phone rang and it was the GEOS Rescue Coordination Center calling in response to the spot device. Though the boat was registered, the spot device was registered for the boat, the EPIRB was not. So that wasn't useful for contacting the Rescue Coordination Center, but it was however useful in a minute. Um, the Rescue Coordination Center confirmed the, uh, the incident that, that it's not an accidental uh, setting off of uh, any, any device. And they told us that a Navy aircraft would be overhead in 10 minutes. And they did. The aircraft was able to find us easily because the 
EPIRB sends out a 121.5 megahertz signal. So they, they, in addition to knowing our location, they also got a radio signal from us. Now, spot devices don't use that. EPIRB devices do. So I'd just like to amplify that although a spot device is very useful, it's not a, it's not a alternative to keeping an EPIRB aboard your boat. Okay. So the aircraft, the Navy aircraft comes around and uh, he's circling overhead. I'm talking to him on 16 on the VHF. And uh, he asked us if we need any, need a life raft and we didn't, we had one, although we hadn't deployed it yet. But he confirms that the boat is indeed sinking and uh, notified a container ship that he had her seen 18 miles away. Now this container ship is registered on a service called Amver, and Rich can talk about that, but it's a service that if you're in the shipping business, you register and you say that you are, your ships will assist another boat in, in danger at sea. And the container ship agreed to divert their course to come to assist us. So we, uh, at this point, what are we at now about in my notes here from 2014? It's around uh, four o'clock in the morning. Um, we get in the life raft, bring the dog, or oh, we had the owner's dog with us too, by the way, which we saved as well. So with the three of us and the dog get in the life raft. And when we, do when we departed the boat, uh, we could see the lights of the container ship on the horizon. So we were talking to them on the VHF we had to set off uh, a couple of flares because by this time the power was out on the boat. There were no lights uh, and the little blinking light on top of the raft isn't visible for very far away. But it, with a couple of flares, the container ship located our position so they wouldn't run over us while they were trying to save us. And then came probably the most dangerous part of the whole evening was trying to get from a life raft onto an even a small container ship. This was less than a thousand feet, but when you're sitting in a life raft next to a thousand foot ship, it looks like a giant wall to climb. They uh, lowered the uh, pilot boarding ladder, which is a angled ladder. It comes down and at the bottom is a platform that pilots will jump off the pilot boat and climb up and do what they do. So they, one of the uh, largest of the Filipino crew lashed to the, to the railing on the ladder, came down the ladder, and every time the, the uh, life raft would raise up on top of a wave, we were close enough to the platform so that the guy on the platform could pull each of us individually out of the life raft onto the boat. Um, we will, we will uh, oh, a great debt of gratitude to, uh, everybody involved, the Rescue Coordination Center, the uh, Navy aircraft, and uh, everyone on the uh, shipping line. I don't remember the name of the shipping line, but the boat was Cap Domingo. Um, they were registered in the Marshall Islands and they had a Greek crew with, uh, Greek officers with a Filipino crew, but they treated us as celebrities uh, during the time it was the only, we were the only crew they had ever rescued. So it was as big a deal for them as it was for us. But anyway, that's, uh, that's my story. The boat is somewhere in the bottom of the uh, Caribbean that's pretty deep at that point. Anyway. Lynn, thank you very, uh, very much. Um, I don't know of a way to practice uh, climbing those uh, harrowing ladders that you, uh, the ladder you described and one guy grabbing you. If he had just released his grasp, would, you or any of the crew been lost? Uh, we might have fallen out of the life raft and we'd have to climb back in and yeah. How'd you get the dog up? Ah, well, while we were sitting in the life raft waiting for the container ship, we thought about that too. And we didn't know if they were just gonna lower a rope ladder that we'd have to climb up like pirates. So we took the drogue chute from the, uh, from the raft and cut some holes in it and put the dog's front legs through those holes and pull the bat, the collar around his neck and tie the loop. So now 
we had, they could tie a line on it or just grab it and pull the dog up. So that's how we saved the dog. Hey, Very David. Good. Yeah, yeah, yes, Rich. But the comment about Amver, uh, well, first, Len, maybe you should have rigged the same kind of deal for you guys as you did for the dog. It might have been safer than the latter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Amver uh, is the, uh, the, the, it's called the Automatic uh, Maritime Voluntary Emergency uh, response. It's gone through various acronyms over the years, but it started by, in the, by the Coast Guard in 1958 in the Atlantic, and now it's worldwide. 22,000 merchant ships are volunteer members. And the odds are that if you go to sea beyond the, uh, two or 300 miles from any coast, uh, that it's a merchant ship that's going to rescue you, not a Coast Guard or, or some foreign Coast Guard. So you, you have to be prepared to deal with uh, Lend situation where you're getting up onto a merchant ship, and that is risky. Uh, the, some of the merchant ships, their their officers really do a wonderful job maneuvering the ships. Some don't. This is not something they practice. Uh, there are alternatives to get on board. Typically, the, the merchant ship will try to provide a lee and drift down on the on the uh, boat, uh, but that's not always easy to do. Uh, but you have the boarding ladders. That's probably the most dangerous way to get on a ship. Sometimes they'll put nets over the side, you grab on, they pull the nets up. You better have gloves on because your knuckles are going to get beaten up. Uh, or they can hoist you up. Uh, nothing is that easy. Probably the only one that is a little easier is if they actually launch their man overboard rescue boat and use that. But uh, uh, if there's a seaway going, there is risk in getting out onto the ship. And uh, there's even a case to be made for staying in the raft and the ship staying near you until daylight or until it calms down a little bit. Uh, it's, it's a decision you have to make at the time. But the number one chance of rescue, in, if you're sailing worldwide, is a merchant ship. Fa uh, number two might be, a, if you're racing, a competitor, like we've seen in the Vondi race. Uh, the uh, least likely case is the Coast Guard, and that happens only when you're nearby. So uh, you got to be ready for, for all of them. By the way, the, in the past 20 years, the Amber system has rescued almost 3,000 people. So it's quite a system. Wow. Thank you, Rich. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Tom Smalley. And Tom is going to be talking to us today from uh, Manchester, Massachusetts, near Boston. Uh, he was on his Swan 411, 150 miles south of Nantucket Shoals when the boat caught fire. Uh, Tom had made the trip uh, to and from uh, Newport, Bermuda, many times, raced, cruised, uh, had won his class in the boat. And uh, Tom, would you come on and tell us about your experience, please? The trip was from Fairhaven to uh, Bermuda to St. Lucia. And uh, I had a crew of six, all experienced sailors that had sailed with me many times, uh, most of them anyway. Uh, they were pretty well uh, trained in various functions. I had a marine electrician, I had a paramedic, a navigator, and a couple of guys that were just uh, pretty handy around a boat. Um, before we started, we've had many practice uh, sales for familiarity of the boat in terms of its uh, operation. We had a man, man overboard drills, practice deploying a drogue, familiarity with life uh, de deployment, and a, a real detailed review of the operations manual, which uh, was pretty uh, extensive, showed where everything was and how to use systems and so forth. Uh, we departed uh, at six o'clock at night, uh, going over through Quicks Hall and, and, and out, out to sea. The sailing conditions were really nice through the night and into the next day and uh, into the evening. But that evening, the swells were building and the wind was dying down. Some weather was offshore. One of my crew had a communication with a, a wind jammer uh, out of Camden, Maine that was close by. And uh, they were personal friends. And so we had a good conversation going with them. And uh, my, my boat, we tried to keep a, a, a course, uh, a speed of five to six knots because we knew there was weather coming and we wanted to get to Bermuda. But the uh, speed reduced under sail for three to four knots. So I started the engine uh, to get to Bermuda because of this weather uh, possibility and wanted to maintain a speed that would get me there 
ahead of any weather conditions. Motoring, I started the engine and we were motoring, but I couldn't get it up to five to six knots, which was rather odd. So I wondered if my uh, folding propeller had uh, closed and wasn't open. So I put it in reverse and backed up, which usually uh, opens the propeller. And, uh, but that didn't seem to work. So then I went below to check, uh, to check some other functions of the boat and check the prop. I mean, the, uh, the shaft down below, and, and I opened it up and uh, there was a foreign wire, never saw it before, lying on the shaft. And so um, I tried to get a flashlight to look to see where it was connected to, but I couldn't see it. So I just carefully grabbed it and wiggled it and then there was a spark uh, up forward uh, behind the engine room. And uh, so I asked one of the uh, crew that uh, happened to be the guy that was on the radio with the, the wind jammer to lift the, the engine cover up. And that was uh, quite a mistake because when I did that, the flames just roared up and started to go up into the, uh, the uh, bulkhead. And I yelled out to the rest of the crew that we had a fire going and get the fire extinguishers. And so um, that's when it all started. And uh, the fire quickly expanded to other areas and there's a word for it, and I don't know what it is, but it caught onto the cushions, caught onto the the uh, the Airx core above the on the on the, on the deck. It caught onto the, uh, uh, the the curtains, and it was pretty pretty uh, pretty wild actually. And uh, so I, I since it didn't look like we were getting it under under control, I went out and I. Um, fired off a flare so that the wind jammer could see us. And uh, the, uh, the operator that was on the radio got that off before we lost power. And uh, I, I, I then came back down, uh, not quite, I, I came back down to see if I could help uh, with the buckets of water, the fire extinguishers, the crew know where everything was, they were fighting it really, really well. And it looked like it was getting under control, but we couldn't get it out. So uh, I told three of the crew to go up and start deploying the life raft. And I uh, deployed the uh, EPIRB and uh, continued to fight the fire, turned off the battery switches. And uh, there was uh, only flashlights to work uh, with the inspection of the battery location. And it was frightening as the cables from the battery to the Starter were illuminated like uh, Roman candles, and uh, the marine electric, electric uh, electronic technician was able to disconnect these, and this seemed to uh, mitigate the fire. And we were able to get the fire under control and eventually out. So uh, when I came up um, after that to to find out what was going on with the rest of the crew because I wanted to keep count of everybody because we were separated. Three of the crew were already in the life raft. The Roseway had come by and they had got a tether over to, uh, to the life raft and to the, and to the boat. And they were just uh, standing still. They were waiting to uh, uh, see what was gonna go on. And uh, they said that uh, they were supportive of any decision that I made. Uh, if I wanted to keep uh, going. But the uh, Coast Guard was over us in the Falcon jet and they we had communications from a um, handheld radio that I had on the life raft and uh, they were urging uh, abandoning ship. And, uh, and the Coast Guard also notified the New Bright through Ambers and, um, and, and they had turned them around. That was a a container ship that was on its way to Norfolk. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we, we had some communication in terms of where we were gonna cast them and so forth. But they came back at the same time as the Roseway was there. And they tried to launch uh, their lifeboat, but they had extraordinarily difficult because the swells were so high and the wind was, there wasn't much wind, but the swells were just bouncing the ship all over the place. So they failed. So then uh, 
we abandoned ship. I want before I abandoned ship. I wanted to really uh, assess the damage uh, to see exactly what what I had on my hands, and I went aboard and I went down with the flashlights and I looked around and to my horror, I could see that the plastic on the instruments had melted, the uh, curtains, the cushions, the ceiling, uh, the air core on the deck, the uh, engine wasn't working, the, the stores were spoiled. So I came up and I said to the guys, uh, well, you know, this boat can be replaced. You guys can't. So let's go to the uh, to the Roseway. So as much as I was uh, depressed about it, but I, I these were good guys, good friends, and great sailors. So we got onto the Roseway. And I want to tell you something. You talk about getting onto a co container ship. Um, try to get onto a schooner with high topsides in the swell. It's not not as easy as one might think, even though they had a crew there grabbing each of us, uh, almost throwing us off over to the other side. But we got on and uh, we ended up taking the, the roseway to, uh, uh, to Bermuda. And um, the boat was abandoned. It was left as a hazard to, to navigation. It was never seen again, uh, you know? So the boat can be replaced, but the guys can't. By the way, 90 days later, I had another 411. Uh, so uh, that's my story. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, very uh, scary stuff. And uh, clearly you made the right decision. Our next uh, panelist uh, is John Sangmeister. Uh, John uh, will be with us from Long Beach, California. He's a passionate, uh, Transpac sailor. Um, he had his disaster on his own Santa Cruz 70 uh, rudder failure in 2019. That was about 300 miles into the race offshore en route to um, Hawaii. Want to mention that he sailed twice in the America's Cup with Dennis Connor on Stars and Stripes. He's been on the America's Cup Organizing Committee, Board of U.S. Sailing, and he's also a movie star in that he <laughs> was uh, recruited by Francis Ford Coppola for the motion picture win, uh, not only as a technical advisor, but also as a sailor, stuntman, and an actor. So, John, I know you won't be acting when you tell us your story. We want the reality. Come on, please. Aloha and good morning and uh, thank you, David. And thank you, Rich, for having me part of this distinguished panel. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. I'm hoping that I can share some of the lessons we learned in our mishap uh, in July of 2019. Um, we had a beautiful boat. And after the worst start in the history of, uh, uh, of ocean racing, our uh, OEX was doing a nice job uh, getting us through the fleet. Prior to the start of the race, uh, I had the good fortune of sailing with this crew uh, and, and as many as uh, six Transpacs together. We've been sailing together as a team now for over 16 years, off and on. There was only one fellow that I'd, I'd never done the Transpac with, but he was uh, very experienced. Um, but I had a, had a brief meeting with the, with the crew before the start, and I said, you know, my, my only real job is to ensure that all of you get home safely to your families. Everything else is gravy. And, um, and I also like to steal uh, another line from uh, uh, a famous Transpac helmsman who said, the other purpose of Transpac is that at the end of the race that you're all better friends than you were when you started the race. And uh, I think we, we achieved both of those goals. Um, OEX is a Santa Cruz 70 designed by Bill Lee it was, uh, a really successful boat, uh, won the barn door twice. We set several records with the boat. It had been in our family for nearly 15 years. And uh, I bought it from my father-in-law about 10 years ago and uh, we've been having an awful lot of fun with it. Um, we were well prepared for any calamity. Um, we had our Switlick life rafts on the back of the boat. And uh, if I can offer one thing, 
I would encourage you always to be over rafted because if you've never stepped into a raft in earnest, I can tell you that there are small confining places. And if you have to be there for a while, um, more is better. Uh, we elected to take an extra probably 150 pounds with uh, two six man rafts. We were only a crew of nine. We probably could have uh, gone to a single raft or a small valise to go with it, but we decided to go with two. Uh, prior to this presentation, uh, David asked, where were you in the race or when this happened? And the important thing to remember is that we were 15 miles ahead of our competitors. And, uh, uh, and I say that with great respect. I've, uh, I've sailed with Roy and uh, his father, and I started with them in 1987 on the first Pi Wacket. And uh, Roy Sr. wrote my letters of recommendation to business school and I've uh, been forever intertwined in the Disney Pi Wacket crew and their friends, their competitors, their worthy adversaries. And, uh, uh, and in this case, they were our rescuers. So um, we were sailing along. And of course, these things only happen at night in the dead of night. It was about uh, 1.50 in the morning. Uh, we were doing anywhere from 13 to 17 knots as we were starting to surf. We had uh, a small jib and a reef in the main and the boat was performing just beautifully. We had made a series of modifications to the boat, none around the rudder, um, but uh, we were really happy with our performance. Um, and as I was trimming the main sheet, uh, two feet from the rudder post, I heard the loudest bang I've ever heard on a sailboat and um, our helmsman said that he'd uh, lost steering. We feared that we were gonna go into a jibe. Uh, we eased everything and uh, prepared to douse the headsail. And as I was running forward to uh, uh, take the jib down, I looked down and, and water was rushing in and I knew we were gonna sink. Um, Billy Tranquil tells the story about Stars and Stripes sinking in, in Long Beach Harbor in 2003, and that happened in less than two minutes. And uh, I was on board uh, Betsby uh, in 1995 with my wife as a guest when one Australia sank, and uh, that happened in less than 90 seconds. We had uh, put a large watertight bulkhead in the bow because the last eight transpacks I've done, we've, uh, we've managed to hit everything from telephone poles at 30 knots to nets and other debris. So the ocean is littered with, with um, trash and other detritus. And if, if you haven't made uh, at least that bow bulkhead, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, three weeks prior to this race, I asked a, a dear friend and, and yacht designer, should I put a bulkhead in front of uh, the rudder post? And he sort of said, you know, you're probably gonna hit the keel first. So it's okay, you'll be all right. And we're still friends and, um, and uh, I, if, you, if you have an older boat or if you have a big wide open race boat, uh, at least a dam that goes up above the waterline uh, would be helpful. Because as things happen, it, it, it happens very quickly. Um, immediately the crew, the off watch came alive. Our navigator, Brendan Bush was on the radio um, and I can't, speak to his uh, calm demeanor uh, more. He was brilliant on the radio. And, um, and the Coast Guard boomed back from uh, St. Nicholas Island, which is uh, uh, about 100 miles behind us. And uh, they weren't in the area, but the uh, Teddy Roosevelt was. They were doing maneuvers off of San Clemente. And uh, they detoured a, a Sea King that was in the air, skippered by the uh, son of a of an OEX crew member, and he heard OEX, and uh, he apparently he firewalled the, the helicopter to our location. Um, as the water was coming in, I I uh, directed uh, two of our crew to get the rafts out and launched um, because I didn't know how much time we were going to have. Ryan Braymeyer and Eric Burzens worked in the back of the boat trying to get the rudder out, and. It, if you can imagine this whirling dervish of a, of a five inch square rudder stock spinning around with every wave and destroying everything around it. Um, Bruce Cooper, the head of Ullman Sales here in uh, Long Beach or here in uh, Newport Beach 
tells the story of a similar incident on Condor in a, in a Cabo race and the force of the rudder post pinning his arm against uh, a bulkhead broke his arm. So it was a pretty violent scene down below. Water was coming in quickly and um, we knew that we were, we were not winning the war. The RAS deployed after uh, a couple of uh, anxious moments. Uh, we kept them close astern to the back of the boat and, uh, and I, we took some uh, sail ties and we tied the two rafts together. They have a, a series of webbing around the edge and we tied those two together and made preparations to deploy. The EPIRBs went off. We had three EPIRBs on board, two for the boat and a personal one. Uh, everyone knew where we were. Um, surprisingly, um, uh, the, uh, the one thing that really got our families notified was uh, if you've ever had a yellow brick, if you haven't looked at the device closely, because it's always wrapped up in that, in the, uh, the holding uh, device that you Velcro to your stanchion, there's a red SOS button on that. And that's a great button. And if you haven't tried that button out, and you want to wake up a race committee, hit that button because all of their tracking internationally goes off immediately. So Yellow Brick in England calls Tom Trujillo in, in Oahu, who starts calling family members. It's a wonderful thing. And if you haven't used it, I hope you don't ever have to use it, but be aware that, that it's there. We were losing the battle. And when we finally, Eric and, and um, and Ryan managed to get the quadrant off the boat, uh, off the rudder post. And with each wave, as the boat would lift up, they would push with their legs and try to get the one inch of the rudder post down. When they finally got the rudder out, we tried the bung, we tried the plug, we tried a bucket. And the wellhead pressure, I mean, that slide that Rich posted of 300 gal or 1,300 gallons an hour, or whatever it was, Ryan is a big fellow and he sat on that thing and got shot off like he was sitting in a, uh, a top of geyser. It was just overwhelming. Um, as a suggestion for all offshore sales, uh, sailors, one thing that happened that compounded the problem is the rudder post went through, it managed to destroy our bilge pump lines and our exhaust lines. So. Now we actually had four holes in the back of the boat. And um, as that was happening, we, you know, we'd stuff something in one hole and a tennis ball would fly out. Or um, as a solution to that, that I would recommend would be flapper valves externally on the transom. Uh, I don't know if it would have helped in this situation. I don't know if anything would have, uh, other than a, a watertight bulkhead forward of the rudder post. Piwak, it was uh, about 15 miles behind us at the time of the break. And thankfully their layout, they have uh, two VHF radios, uh, one in the galley and one at the nav station. And Roy and Ben Mitchell, Roy Disney and Ben Mitchell were getting ready to go on watch. And um, they overheard the radio traffic and they turned it up and, and thankfully, uh, you know, we we were rescued by one of the best crews in the world and they diverted. Um, as we were getting ready to go, you know, I, I still had that, that one vision of one Australia sinking and I kept worrying that with the large wa watertight bulkhead in, in the bow, that somehow the boat would sink bow up and the rig would crash down on the life rafts and further compound the problem with injury. And if you have, a mishap at sea, you are far ahead of the game if you don't have any injuries. I've been in, in accidents, filming wind, a, a fellow, we crushed two guys between the 12 meter and a rib. And I was in the water with a guy who ultimately lost his leg because of the, the impact. If you can avoid injuries, I would encourage you to do that. This is not the time for heroics if there are alternate strategies to get your crew safely off the boat. And um, so when I saw the, the running lights at Piwak and I said, boys, it's time to go. And if 
you know, looking down below, Ryan and Eric were there and it was, it was akin to every submarine movie you've ever seen, like close the hatch or we're all going to sink. It was like, Ryan, Eric, we got to go or the boat, you know, you're going down with this. And um, we were sitting in the rafts and, and you know, we're going to look back in a little bit of humor now because tragedy and comedy are very closely tied to one another. And uh, I was looking at it, our beloved OEX sinking and um, and I, I, I let out a loud expletive and the boys thought uh, he said that the boat's sinking. And I said, no, my Rolex was in the, was in the uh, chart table. Now this wasn't any Rolex. This is a Rolex that uh, Roland Pouton flew down 28 watches in 1987 and presented it to the crew when we won the America's Cup. So it was, it had some sentimental value. And as I was being dragged aboard Piwak it in a less than uh, elegant fashion, Brendan Bush, our navigator, stuck out his arm and said, looking for this? And if you can imagine the presence of mind as he's up to his chest in water, he decided to look inside the chart table and, um, and see if there were any valuables in there that he should grab before he left the boat. And I'm grateful to that. Um, we got home, I'll go through a couple of my, there's a nice photo of Roy and I, and, and, and Roy and I have known each other a long time and I am grateful for his friendship. And, uh, and this is on the trip home. We were welcome on board Piwacket and uh, they shared fellowship. They shared tuna. We shared, you know, cocktail hours. Uh, we watched the boat sink and then we turned around and sailed home. And it was a long trip home and uh, they gave us dry clothes. Uh, you know, they got out of their bunks and said, here, you know, uh, get some sleep. I called uh, Tom Trujillo on the, on the sat phone. And he says, you know, we think the boat's still floating. And I said, mm, I don't think so. And he said, well, we can still see you on the tracker. And I went back to my crew and I was talking with them and they say, they think the boat's still floating because they can see the tracker. And Ryan Braemeyer looks at me and goes, I have the tracker. He's like, why do you have the tracker? He goes, well, you've already lost so much money. I wanted you to get your $150 deposit back for the tracker. We got back, uh, this is an early photo. This is my first uh, trip with Piwak way back when. You can see uh, Roy Edward and Roy Pat in the center. Uh, Roy Pat's got the broom. We're all younger and we all had more hair back then. Um, when we got home, I uh, nominated uh, Roy and his crew for the Arthur B. Hansen Rescue Medal. And, uh, the uh, Board of U.S. Sailing uh, unanimously affirmed that nomination and had the privilege of presenting that at the uh, Transpac Award ceremony to the entire crew. Uh, and it was, you know, it was a well-earned. And, uh, you know, the, the sad part was not only did OEX get out of the race, but uh, the Piwacken team had to uh, sacrifice their race as well on our behalf and I'm forever grateful to that. Um, this is a photo of us back in Marina del Rey. We arrived 26 hours later and uh, you can see Paul and Gary and, uh, and the OEX crew and uh, there's Roy in the center. And uh, you know, it was nice to be with friends on the way home. Um, my wife, my beautiful bride picked us up at three in the morning and we drove back to our house and. We were still in our foul weather gear. It was all the clothing we had and uh, the crew is in our kitchen. And uh, many of you know that years ago I had a midlife crisis and I bought an offshore racing trimaran that is still in our family. And uh, she looked at all of us and she said, in, in all seriousness, you sank the wrong fucking boat. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful that we're here. I'm hoping that we'll be able to do the race again this summer. Um, uh, here are some, uh, some takeaways and I'll leave this slide up for everyone. Uh, there are a few things that we did learn. Again, make certain that, you're, that you avoid injuries. Um, if you have the opportunity to do the, uh, the practical course, we had all done that. And that level of familiarity with getting into a raft in earnest and, and lighting uh, flares in earnest, that was really helpful. 
So thanks for letting me be part of this. John, thank you very much. You, you tell it uh, so well. We're awfully glad you're still with us and that you have your Rolex. Um, some of you may need to uh, get off to understand that. Uh, we'll, we're probably gonna run over by uh, 10 minutes uh, anyway, and there's still some good stuff ahead, including the answers to the quizzes. But first, uh, our next panelist, our last panelist, uh, is my old friend, Les, Les Crane. Um, Les uh, and I have uh, raced together on my boat. We've cruised in company together, um, raced in the Hebrides and sailed in company in, uh, in Sweden, each on our own boats. Uh, he's the former Commodore of the Royal Bermuda Yacht Club, a Canadian by birth. He lives in Bermuda where he'll be speaking to us from where he'll be speaking to us uh, today. Uh, his disaster was on his uh, far 56 called Monterey in 2017, and it occurred in a race that uh, Les had organized uh, from Antigua to Bermuda, and the disaster took place uh, 250 uh, nautical miles south of Bermuda. So Les, uh, over to you. Good morning. This is Monterey, our FAR pilot host, 56, finishing the arc in 2016. Our trouble happened as we were sailing the inaugural Antigua Bermuda race a year later. We had a crew of six, including Commodore Bob Medland, who is with, here with us today. It was a beautiful night and we were reaching along at eight knots. At the start of the 4 a.m. watch, we discovered we were taking on water. Calling all crew up, I closed the seacocks on the through holes as we all tried to identify the source of the water. We had a laminated chart of the boats plumbing with the seacocks highlighted. We knew that Esprit de Corps was five miles behind us. We tried to reach them on the VHF to notify them of our situation, but got no response. At the same time, we contacted RCC Bermuda on the sat phone to alert them. At this point, we were merely looking for EDC to come and stand by as we attempted to solve our problem. Meanwhile, two crew had been trying to use a large manual pump without success. The boat was filling surprisingly fast, much more than would be explained by a broken or detached hose. I told Kit to add Mayday to his VHF callout and had Jock set up a parachute flare. The parachute flare did the job. Jock called out that he could see EDC's lights shift towards us. Shortly thereafter, they came up on the VHF. While pitch dark, the weather conditions were benign with a 12 knot breeze, but there was a swell that would prevent EDC from coming alongside. We would need the life raft to transfer to EDC. The boys launched the raft of course, it inflated upside down. As the crew drew the tether in, Bob and I were able to get on the sugar scoop and muscle the raft upright in the lee of the boat. Knowing we were now safe, I went below again to reassess the situation. The boat was now bowed down with three feet of, of water in the forward cabin. With the volume of water in the boat, I was total, it, it was totally impossible to determine the source. I could not see anything that could be done and was concerned that the boat might become unstable as it filled further. The boat was replaceable, while getting someone trapped or hurt was another matter. I decided to abandon ship and get everyone in the raft. The raft, being held tightly to the stern, made this quite simple. It was now 5 a.m., just 45 minutes after realizing the leak was more than just a flooded head. EDC was approaching at this point. We cut loose and drifted away from Monterey. Monterey posted a scheduled position on Yellow Brick at 7.30 a.m., but not at 8.30. Presumably that bracketed her sinking. In about an hour, we had gone from tranquility, a beautiful evening sail, to the deck of our rescuer. So what caused the problem? <clears throat> we might have hit something. However, we didn't feel a lurch as you would expect to be as hit something heavy like a uh, container. There might have been structural failure. When the boat was in uh, uh, Croatia one winter, the rig had been over tightened and perhaps that uh, put stress on the hull and caused, uh, which would, could have led to failure. <clears throat> the bow thruster housing might have failed. This was suggested by the developer of the boat um, and had it been the case, that would explain the volume of water that we were seeing. Lessons learned. We had spent a great deal of time aboard the boat throughout the summer and fall of 2016. Three of the six aboard were part of the ARC crew. Perhaps our familiarity had created some overconfidence. 
while I'm not sure we would have been able to change the eventual outcome, in hindsight, there are things we could have done better. In advance of an offshore voyage, in addition to a man overboard drill, we should have conducted a flooding drill. Organization and practice would have optimized our time. So what's involved? The first item, most importantly, is to assign responsibilities. We had six crew. My uh, plan would have been to have two people on each of these three subjects. By having two people on each subject, you get a person second guessing each other uh, and that uh, ensures that something's not overlooked. The first responsibility is flood investigation, the second pumps, the third communication. Flood investigation, what's involved here? Once the boat has significant water, it's very difficult to identify the source. So the first question is, did something unusual happen? In doing the drill, you want to open and close each seacock to ensure that you understand the location. If the seacock functions correctly, uh, you will want to identify other possible sources of flooding. In our case, the stern gland, the bow thruster, the rudder gator, transducers. Uh, and you want to prioritize things. You want to have an order of action. In our case, would we close all the seacocks, then check the stern gland, then other possible sources. And it's important that you not stop looking until the water is going down and that, that this group doesn't get distracted from their role. This is the chart of uh, the various uh, hull, through hulls and um, other uh, things under the water um, that uh, we needed to investigate. On the left, you see the chart that we had on the boat. On the right is the chart that I wish we'd had on the boat. Um, the large print on this chart allows us to uh, read it without needing glasses. The crew involved in the pumps uh, need to know the location and the switching of all the pumps and all of their overboard outlets. Um, they uh, want to be familiar with uh, the, the use of a portable trash pump, which I'll speak to in a couple of minutes. Um, they want to fill the bilges with fresh water at the dock and test each pump, observing how uh, they outflow. They should ask, can the forepeak be sealed off? In the case of Monterey, uh, we had a workroom forward and it would have been quite uh, simple to, uh, uh, to create a forward uh, bulkhead uh, by closing the door and just sealing a couple of uh, leak, a couple of uh, ports underneath the, the, the door. I spoke about a, a portable trash pump. This is uh, something that uh, we set up for a trip um, a transatlantic in uh, 2019. Um, you can see it has uh, a, 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 the largest pump that we could find uh, and um, a two inch trash hose. And the total cost of this was all 300 bucks. Subsequently, uh, and in talking with other people, I realized that we could rather than use this uh, DC pump, use an AC pump such as you see here. Um, this pump has a, a full horsepower, uh, which is a lot more than that uh, AC, uh, DC pump had, um, and incredibly inexpensive. Uh, this whole kit that you see in front of you here is $70. I spoke about testing pumps. When we were in uh, the Azores, we tested, uh, a, uh, we did a, a flood test or a flooding drill. Uh, and there was a huge um, uh, pump on, on the boat, beautiful looking thing, uh, absolutely no water coming through it. We took it apart and this is what we found. You can see the salt crusted in the center. The pump was totally useless. We were able to clean it, fix it and, um, and uh, uh, make it worthwhile and make it working. The third group uh, is the communications group. Uh, this group should uh, know how to access the current location, identify nearby boats on AIS. They should be familiar with the VHF system. Um, they should train with both the ship's VHF and the handheld. Uh, they should know how the SAT phone works. Uh, they should ensure that SAT phone is all the emergency numbers program that they uh, might need. They lo should log a test call with authorities. Um, RCC Bermuda is happy to hear from boats on their way to Bermuda. Uh, they, the scoop would also be responsible for the EPIRB, players, life raft, grab bags. 
So what's some of the, to summarize some of the equipment I'd suggest everybody should have, you should have a high water alarm, large print list of hull openings, strong torches, uh, and uh, a, a portable trash pump. Another item is parachute flares. Parachute flares have been dropped off the required solace list about a couple of years ago in favor of uh, electronic means of, of, uh, of attraction. Uh, it's a mistake. Um, we didn't get a response on, from any of the uh, boats that were nearby until we set off a parachute flare. There was about 22 miles behind us that saw the parachute flare. It's just a different mode of uh, communication and uh, it's important. A couple of other observations while we're at it. Um, I thought the connection between the tether and the life raft was a bit questionable. Um, there's only 12 knots of breeze. Uh, in 30 knots of breeze, the, uh, the pressure on the life raft would be huge. While I'm not aware of stories of, uh, of the tethers breaking, um, and I realized that the tether is uh, designed to have a, uh, uh, so that the boat can't uh, tow the life raft down. Uh, there's a knife on the, on the uh, tether and um, designed particularly to cut the tether. Uh, and I think I'd like to re rely on that rather than uh, the junction that I could see. Um, another thing is when you're launching a life raft, you, before doing so, you wanna ensure that the tether is led through a uh, fair lead and onto a winch that the crew have gloves on because even at 12 knots of breeze, there's a lot of load on the on this uh, tether. Uh, in 30 knots of breeze, it'd be hell. And you, you want to be sure that you can get that life raft right against the boat so that people can get into the life raft without having to get in the water. This idea that you'd clip onto the tether and swim across the life raft, not a good idea. So that's uh, some of my comments. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for joining me. Thank you, Les. The rescue boat right behind uh, Monterey, Les's, Les's boat, uh, had a French film crew on it. So this is a four minute uh, video. Uh, and uh, I hope that you can, uh, you can see it. We're not gonna try to reach them yet. We're gonna keep our distance. We'll observe and wait for direction to and secure yourself before anyone else. You need to be secure to help other people. We're ready to abandon ship. Ready to abandon ship. Are you ready or waiting? Okay, we stay on your side. You wait, whatever you want. We're here for you. So là, tu peux nous ouvrir la ligne à l'arrière. Tu enlèves les lashings qui sont sur petit bord. Les deux premiers lashings en haut là. Les trois premiers là. Okay, they're they're free. Okay, we're coming to you. Nice and slow. Just gonna wait to be that you're getting away from your boat for safety. Uh, Watch, there is a line at, at the back of them. There is a line at the back. Put go neutral. Uh, yeah. on board. You're sitting, sitting in the front, right there. Yeah, yeah. I'm good, I'm good. Okay, try to stop. Let me grab onto your harness. There you go. Grab on my shoulder. Ready? Okay. You want me to grab the line back? Try to get that line out of the water. Good story, teacher. Yeah. Okay, sir. You go. You're done. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Watch your step there. There's not much of a step down below. Thank you. Yeah, nice to see you.
Cam, <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs> so, uh, what happened, guys? Did you get something? We don't know. We don't know what it is, but she filled up fast. Wow. It was so full, you can't find, you can't see yeah. where the water's coming in. Who would have thought it? Jesus Christ. Uh, I was up at four, I uh, went into the head. It was already a wash, and it's now 5.20, 5.25. Tell us where you want us to put it. That's Cam. Cam? Yeah, we're here. Here's Cam. Cam. So, carrying on, uh, Rich, could you tell us the answer to the quiz questions? Um, and then we'll go to a Q&A for those who want to stick with us. Okay. Uh, quickly, just before going through this, I, I could make a couple of comments on our five panelists' presentations. First, uh, they were terrific, and you heard uh, five uh, terrific uh, uh, examples of leadership and correct response, uh, modifying plans as they went along, and uh, with, with great outcomes where everybody was saved. And uh, you look back at this, and, and uh, sure, maybe a few improvements could have been made in, in having a piece of equipment available, but uh, the five outcomes were kind of, you know, almost preordained once they uh, got uh, part way along. I think the fact that these five owner skippers got their crew off safely, made their decisions is, is really incredible. They also applied so many of the principles we talked about in the, in the PowerPoint. Uh, uh, the, uh, just a few quick comments on the life rafts. Karina, we had two six man for a 10 person crew. John had two six man for a nine person crew. I think having that Little excess capacity is very smart. And if you have a, uh, a crew of more than 10 people, trying to do it in one raft is crazy. The rafts are so heavy. And if, it fa if one raft fails and you only have one, you got a problem. So the double rafts for the bigger crews is really useful. It means two ditch kits. It means having uh, an EPIRB for each, and uh, which might mean three EPIRBs, one in each ditch kit and one on the boat. Uh, the painters on the life rafts are designed so if the boat goes down and the paint is still attached, it'll break and uh, won't take the raft with it. Uh, I've not heard of a raft painter breaking unintentionally, but uh, you don't want to launch a raft until you're actually ready to use it. Otherwise, you're asking for trouble. Uh, to go through, uh, there are a couple of other quick questions. Uh, uh, that's one about the EPIRB. Uh, Cindy made comment that uh, they had a crew on their boat with a heart attack and a ship came by, dropped its man overboard dinghy and brought the uh, patient back to the ship in a safer manner than jumping on a pilot ladder. And uh, so to go through this, uh, name the first, name the only two reasons to abandon ship. Uh, it's uh, flooding and fire, B. Uh, uh, one of the uh, people listening asked the question about uh, about PRB, Kevin Escoffier's boat in the recent Vondi, the boat broke in half, it veed and, and went down. Uh, and I don't consider that a third technique. I consider that a severe case of flooding when the hull opens up like that. But uh, basically it's sinking and fire. Uh, the second question, do mass breaks and goes over the side? First action, crew roll call. Got to make sure nobody's trapped or overboard. Uh, pardon me. Uh, three, after you've taken that first action, uh, checking the crew, the fundamental decision you must make about the mast is whether you're gonna cut it loose or retrieve the pieces. And uh, if there's a risk of putting a hole in the side of the hull, you wanna cut loose at least whatever part of the rig <laughs> is damaging the hull. Nice to retrieve pieces, particularly if you're in a remote location, you have to create a, uh, a jury rig. Four. Uh, if you need to cut rigging or knockout pins, loose rigging first or tight rigging first. As we talked about, it's the loose rigging first because then the rig won't shift and create any uh, dangerous situations. Uh, five, uh, sailing on the wind, ram a floating container, it strikes your leeward side, first reaction. Uh, 
I would suggest the first reaction is to tack and get that leeward side up to windward so the hole is either <laughs> out of the water or at least less submerged or less pressure flooding the boat. Uh, uh, six, uh, major fire in the galley, flames coming out of companion. Which of the following do you not do? We certainly wake up the off watch if they haven't woken up, shut fuel valves if you can reach them and commence abandoned ship. But you don't put on foul weather gear to fight a fire because of what we talked about earlier that the foul weather gear will melt against your skin and you've got a hell of a problem then. Better to fight it naked than with foul weather gear on. Uh, thinking of firemen, it's not foul weather gear when they're wearing, it's fireproof asbestos uh, uh, suits. So they're not wearing foul weather gear. Uh, Question seven, you go blow for a snack and find water rising rapidly over the floorboards. Which of the following do you not do? Uh, the answer there is uh, uh, B, throw the raft over the side and inflate. You do not want to put the raft over the side until you know you're abandoning ship. And uh, in the case of Tom with a fire, uh, he put one raft in the water and put half the crew in it. And that, that's okay, because you've got to look at the situation. If that fire is uh, still live and raging, uh, you, may, you may consider a partial abandoned ship. But basically, uh, when that raft goes over the side, the tugging on the painter is going to inflate it. Once it's inflated, it's got windage and it's bouncing around. It can be damaged. It can be lost. Uh, and if, if you solve the problem, once you've inflated it, you can't bring it back aboard. So uh, you throw the raft over when you're... Uh, ready to abandon ship, but you can have the painter led through the a, 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 a block into a winch, all the things that Les talked about while you're waiting. Question eight, uh, squall hits, squall hits, you're sailing fast, reef main number four, you hear a bang on the windward lower shroud, uh, windward lower shroud's flying around, you must tack, uh, get the load on the other side of the rig and save your mast. Your backstay breaks when you're running under spinnaker. On that one, you must luff up. Uh, you want to reduce the load uh, so that, uh, and then you trim the mainsail hard, bang hard, and uh, set a high you to the stern. 10, uh, fire extinguisher classified ABC is usable for, suitable for what types of fires? All of the above, ABC. Uh, 11, what diagrams of bills should be posted prominently in the main cabin? all of them. And, and again, these bills should be uh, uh, customized for your boat and your crew. This is something you've got to uh, actually uh, believe in. Uh, question 12, uh, my favorite. This is the story of Yves Parlier, who uh, rebuilt his rig and finished the race. But I was happy to have my French name in with the other French names. Anybody who put my name in there is just trying to brown nose the scorer. Uh, 13, Ellsman loses steering control and the boat spins into the wind. Uh, you should B, drop head sails. You may not have a serious problem. Something might have just slipped. Uh, you know, no reason to call Mayday. Uh, you don't want to start the engine. Maybe something's in the water and you're going to wrap the prop. Uh, basically, you just drop the head sail. And at least that way, you trim the main and the boat's basically pointing into the wind. It might tack a little bit, but at least it's in a safe position. Uh, Question uh, 14, uh, the rudder appears intact, but there's damage to the cables or shivs or chain. Name two easy ways to steer. Uh, emergency tiller works and the autopilot if you have one works because they don't go through the shivs and the cables. Uh, that gives you time then to do a permanent fix. Uh, 15, if the rudder sheared off or a rudder post broken, What's your biggest danger? And your biggest danger there is flooding through the lower bearing. If the rudder drops out and you're flooding, uh, you should probably be able to save the boat by somehow stopping the flow in the rear bearing. If you're in a small boat, you can put your crew in the bow and usually get the bearing out of the water. Uh, but if in a big boat, that won't work. Uh, but when the rudder post is in there, as John described, you've got a, a serious, serious problem. In a modern sailboat, how would you best regain steering? D, uh, unless you have a real emergency backup rudder like uh, some of the pictures we showed, drogue steering. Uh, the, uh, 
the other three engine won't help you steer. Uh, the first two uh, all, might work, but they're very hard to make work. Joke steering is a gem. And finally, you're in mid-ocean, lightning strikes, and you have a meltdown, you lose all power. So what do you do? Uh, navigate by paper charts and pocket GPS, uh, use emergency running lights, small flashlight through magnetic compass, all of the above. So- hey, thank, thank you, Rich. I wanna mention that we had a very robust return of uh, answers uh, from um, attendees. Um, I've only been able to get to about 20 of them. I've seen one perfect score so far. If you were scoring yourself and uh, you have a perfect score or just one wrong, please um, email me. Uh, and uh, we do have a couple prizes to, to go out. Um, the one perfect score so far is from, uh, that I've seen, there could be many more, was from Dr. Charles Stark down in uh, Florida. Um, we're gonna try to hit a few of the Q and A. Uh, one that came in from a couple of people, uh, Neil Dunkley, uh, Roger Lolick. Uh, what about scuttling the boat before uh, leaving, Rich? Uh, should a skipper just abandon or scuttle when leaving ship? And I don't know there's any rule on that. Uh, in theory, you probably wanna scuttle, so it's not a hazard. But a uh, you know, sailboat out there is certainly not a hazard to ships. Uh, might be a hazard to another sailboat, uh, but there's always a chance it could be a salvage uh, done, and, and that's it's not unheard of. Uh, I think it's much more important to consider how you're going to uh, take care of the crew, and and the scuttling is is less of an issue. Uh, there are cases where uh, boats have been extremely remote, and the ship has stood by, and they've scuttled it the next day. But uh, I, I think it's a it's a case by case. Yeah, and then we have uh, an attendee who asked what the brand and model is of uh, the sump pump, uh, Les, that you were recommending. I know that one that has been recommended is the Gould, uh, which you can um, look up online. It has a stainless steel uh, casing, I believe, uh, high capacity sump, but Les, uh, what was that brand and model you were recommending? Yeah, uh, let me just find it here one second. While Les is looking for it, I see Emily mentioned about fire, that a lot of base layers are made from synthetics, and that is correct. So it's not, you don't want to fight a fire in your synthetic uh, clothing. That's why I mentioned wool or cotton or being naked. So it's not, not a joke. You just don't want to do it with uh, any of the plastics. So whether you're uh, synthetics. Thank you, Rich. Another question has come in from, uh, from several people is, will this be posted? You've heard that it will be, but it's going to be, posted on the uh, websites of the three uh, cross Burgi clubs. Uh, if your club would like a copy of it, uh, certainly email me and we'll try to make it available to you along with the video of uh, Monterey, of the rescue of uh, Monterey. Um, Les, are you ready to cover that? I have to answer that question. Uh, it's called uh, a deck boat. Um, uh, D E K O P R O, and I and what you are looking at there is an Amazon page. Thank you, uh, Wes. We're gonna wrap it up here. Um, thank you very much, uh, Rich. It takes an enormous amount of work to get this sort of thing together, and also our uh, brilliant five panelists. Uh, we had a two-hour practice the other day, um, uh, and uh, you put a lot of time into it as well, and your experiences are really enriching. I also still uh, took notes on several things I myself uh, need to do, uh, taking your advice. Um, uh, Rich asked me to say something about um, the kind of year it is for our clubs that are involved with safety matter and the environment. All three of these clubs, the sponsoring clubs have foundations. Um, so if anybody wants to know how they can make a donation. Uh, certainly we are all volunteers, but a lot of things cost money. Um, and so if you'd like to know how to make a donation to any of them, particular cause, there are uh, uh, young sailors in uh, foreign exchange programs, for example, from the North American Station, the CCA is particularly involved with sea and the environment and storm, uh, storm trisel with uh, safety at sea. 
So uh, let me know and I can put you in touch with the right people. Um, unless any of the panelists, we're getting a lot of thank yous coming in by chat and in the uh, Q of A, it was very appreciated uh, apparently by a lot of people. Come back and join us another time. We'll let you know when we're doing something. And so for right now, uh, signing off from uh, Stanford, Connecticut near New York City for the CCA, the Storm Trisel, and the North American Station of the Royal Scandinavian Yacht Clubs. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you everybody and, and send your comments as you go through this stuff. We appreciate any inputs. Thank you.